In this video here, we're going to learn about the Norman Conquest, and it's explained in 10 minutes, so I know, you know, a whole lot of uh, information is probably left out and stuff. That's why the comment section is there, so that we could discuss it and you all could tell me stuff, you know what I mean? And, you know, I'll tell you what, welcome to Mr. Giant React, and ting, and ting, and ting. Let's go ahead on YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what we could learn here, all right? This video is brought to you by Captivating History. In the beginning, the Norman conquest of England in 1066 was just one in a series of invasions. It started when the forces of the Roman Emperor Claudius arrived in 43 CE. They finally left in 409 CE as their empire crumbled. Britannia, as it was called by the Romans, sank into the period known as the Dark Ages. By the middle of the 5th century, the Anglo-Saxons, Germanic peoples who had arrived after the Romans, were dominant. During this time, England was not a single entity, but a collection of seven kingdoms. Ooh. The most prominent were Mercia and Wessex. The lure of riches and land attracted Viking raiders from Scandinavia, beginning in 793. That year, the wealthy Lindisfarne Monastery in Northumbria was pillaged. There were annual coastal raids for years after that. In 865, the great heathen army from Denmark invaded and <laughs> the great to take over four kingdoms. They captured the northern city of York, or Jorvik, making it their capital. It became the second largest city outside of London. By the end of the 9th century, King Alfred of Wessex had soundly defeated the Vikings. They settled in eastern England, an area known as the Danelaw. The majority Anglo-Saxon population lived south of that line. Why it all happened? The main players. And this brings us to 1066. Now, now check this out. There were so many, it seems, you know, uh, well, uh, according to history, there's so many different people coming and going, coming and going, that even though the people look the same as far as the color of the skin is concerned they were of different clans different tribes or whatever you want to call it so it's a diverse uh, group of people that probably uh evolved evolved from all these invasions and, and you know uh, that happened and i'll be honest with you you know what i mean britain or england whichever one you want to call it have been deemed a superpower for so long with the exception of uh, Hitler trying to uh, destroy them in the Second World War you don't really think of them as being pillaged at all you know what I mean unless you start reading the history and I think that's the, the, the problem with modern society modern society everyday people don't look at the history of a place to understand where you know the place is to the, at the point where they are they just know the modern history of it and that spawns their angst towards those uh those places you know what i mean but let's check the history they have gone through similar things in their past and i know people say well that's their past because no it is but then the people who are claiming to be oppressed they are harping on their past to bolster their uh their claims to get what they want and that's any society be it in africa asia you know north america wherever you go people do that our oh, history says this and this is our history and stuff like that but we're here now so how are we going to fix what's happening now instead of bringing up the past and using the past to create more havoc in the now thus repeating unsavory history you know what I mean? That's why when I, I watch these videos, that's why I always ask, oh, what were the people doing? Or, you know, how, how were the people uh, surviving through that? Not so much how the nobility uh, was surviving, not so much how, how, how the politics was, because we know how politics is. We live in it today. An elite group tries their best to control the, the law group, whether they, they take it by revolution, uh, the country by revolution, or by election. That's what's happening. You know, because any more elections is just another way to fool people into thinking that they get getting what they want. That's just a fact right there. Let's keep going with this. In early January, the Anglo-Saxon king, Edward the Confessor, died childless. Immediately, there were several claims to his throne. Some had stronger claims than others, but all were willing to go to war for the crown. 
Harold Godwinson, the Earl of Wessex, was Edward's brother-in-law and had been the Shadow King for many years. He took care of all the royal duties Edward didn't care to. His father, Godwin, had provided the same service when Edward came to the throne in 1042, after many years of exile in Normandy. He had fled there as a child to escape Danish invasions of England. On his deathbed, January 5th, 1066, it is believed that Edward appointed Harold as his heir. Harold wasn't of royal blood and was only connected to Edward by marriage, but he was an Anglo-Saxon, well-liked and trusted by the people. He got the immediate approval of the Witten, the council responsible for making all key decisions in the kingdom. Harold was crowned the very next day. Meanwhile, in northern France, William, the Duke of Normandy, watched with increasing rage. Only two years before, Harold Godwinson had sworn his support for William's claim to the throne, a promise made under duress since Harold had been William's captive at the time. William reasoned that his claim was the most legitimate. Even though it was widely believed it wasn't, he was the bastard son of Robert I of Normandy. His link to the English royal family came through Edward the Confessor's mother, Emma of Normandy. Her father was William's paternal grandfather. So, William claimed that as a cousin of the late king, he had a right to the throne. As the only son, William inherited his father's dukedom at the tender age of seven. By adulthood, he had proven to be a tactical and brutal leader. He had feuds with surrounding dukes, even the king of France, Henry I, who had been a former ally. Ambition burned brightly within him. The last contender had the weakest claim, King Harold Hadrada of Norway. He was encouraged to make a bid for the crown by Tostig Godwinson, the estranged brother of the new English king. Complicated political maneuverings in England and Scandinavia had followed the death in 1035 of Edward's stepfather, Newt, king of England, Denmark, and Norway. Hardrada made his claim based on those machinations, and with Tostig's help, he mounted an invasion force. The invasion begins, the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Harold Hadrada left Norway in August, collecting allies and men in Shetland and Orkney, before meeting up with Tostig Godwinson on the northeast coast on September 8th. Harold had up to 15,000 men in almost 300 longships, dwarfing Tostig's much smaller force of only 12 ships. King Harold Godwinson was readying to meet the expected invasion from the south by William of Normandy. However, as September approached, he had to let many of his soldiers go as they were needed to gather the harvest. Learning that the Norse army had not only landed, but also captured York, King Harold gathered his men. He made the journey from London to Yorkshire in four days. Hardrada, who was waiting for supplies at Stamford Bridge, was caught completely off guard by the English on September 25th. The exact location of the battlefield is unknown, but local lore sets it east of the River Derwent and southeast of Stamford Bridge in an area called Battle Flats. At the start, the Norwegians were divided in two by the river. As the two armies met, the Vikings on the western side of the river were either killed or fled across the bridge. The Norse then formed a shield wall to meet the oncoming English. The battle raged for hours. Eventually, the English troops were able to force their way through the Norse defenses. Outflanked and with both Hardrada and Tostig dead, the Norwegians were practically wiped out. It is said that some 50 years after the battle, the bleached bones of the dead still lay exposed. The Battle of Hastings By August 1066, William had the support of key French nobles, as well as the Pope. The exact number of troops raised varies from 7,000 to 12,000, depending on the source. After waiting eight weeks for favorable winds, the invasion force landed at Pevensey Bay in Sussex on September 28th. Fresh from his Stamford Bridge victory, King Harold hurried from Yorkshire with 7,000 men behind him to face the Norman army. On October 14th, the two sides met near Hastings. Harold initially had the advantage, mustering his troops at the top of a hill. Forming a shield wall, they first faced William's archers, then his spearmen, followed by cavalry. The Normans failed to make any headway. When a rumor started that William had been killed, there was panic and some of his soldiers turned tail and ran. It wasn't until William showed his face that peace was restored to his army, prompting a new strategy. The Normans tricked the English into thinking that they were in retreat, then turning around to attack their pursuers. Late in the battle, Harold was killed by an infamous arrow in the eye, 
according to the Bayou Tapestry. The death of Harold spelled the end for the English. Although William had won decisively, it did not stop the Witten from electing Edgar Aitling as king. The 15-year-old was the last male heir of the House of Wessex. Although never crowned, he was involved in at least one of the rebellions that sprung up in the early years of William's reign. The harrying of the North campaign saw William deploy scorched earth tactics to wow. put down resistance in early 1070. William was crowned in London at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day, 1066. He ruled until 1087 and oversaw many changes in the English way of life. The legacy of the Norman conquest. William's decisive victory led to the final breaking of ties with Scandinavia. England, unwillingly, was now brought closer to the influence of France and Western Europe. The new king embarked on a campaign of castle building to control the countryside. Norman barons replaced Anglo-Saxon nobles, and each became responsible for building a castle on their lands. William introduced the feudal system of land tenure. The barons provided land in exchange for loyalty, military service, and, of course, taxes. The barons, in turn, rented land to their knights, who divided it amongst the peasants, who did all the work to generate the tax money. This pyramid-like <laughs> scheme worked if everyone remained loyal to the king, who was the only true landowner in the kingdom. Anglo-Saxon England already had well-developed government and legal systems before the conquest. These systems continued to be upheld, but the courts introduced Norman trials by combat for criminal cases. Also, legal proceedings could now call for witnesses to give sworn testimony. The church hierarchy was reorganized, with most high-ranking Anglo-Saxon officials being replaced by Norman bishops and abbots. William also encouraged the founding of monasteries, including Battle Abbey in Hastings, to mark his victory over Harold. The Doomsday Book helped William understand the true picture of wealth in his new kingdom. Over the space of a year, one team of surveyors traveled the length and breadth of England, determining the worth of people's farms and animals. A second team then combed through the results for accuracy. The book exists today as a valued historical reference. And lastly, not enough can be said of the influence the Norman conquest had on the English language. With the court and nobles speaking French, it was only expected that there would be a trickle-down effect. Words like pork, beef, law, and royal entered the language. Some place names like Chapel and Leferth, Ashby de la Zouche, or family names like Beauchamp, which became Beecham, or Vernon appeared. Wow. The Norman influence is still felt to this day in England, as well as in many of the countries which were part of the former British Empire. If you want to discover more about the Norman conquest of England, then check out our book, The Norman Conquest, a captivating guide to the Normans and the invasion of England by William the Conqueror. So pretty much... And correct me if I'm wrong, down in the comment section again, uh, the British people, the English people that we know now are pretty much descendants of the Normans. Yes, some Anglo-Saxons and stuff are still in there. I understand that, but it's the majority you now, the Normans, because uh, once they invaded, they pretty much brought in their own thing there. They kept some of the things, it seems, according to that. But, you know, they also brought in some of their own things, including the language. And, I, you know, I'm pretty interested in the names and where they originate from because apparently over the years they changed them names, you know, like the Beecham was that one before. That's that's really interesting. It's, it's, it's crazy to see how when one group take over another group, how everything just changes, including name, linguistics, uh, to a certain degree culture, unless some groups hang on to the old culture thing, you know what I mean? But this was quite interesting, you know what I mean? And I hope you guys enjoyed watching this with me, you know what I mean? And if you do, drop a like on the video. And please, please comment in the section, in the comment section. Be nice and be kind. Show some compassion. Don't get into that squabble squabble. I man don't like that vibe much, you know what I mean? I'm trying to avoid that by sitting here and watching these videos, you know, enjoying and learning. You understand what I'm saying thing? And uh, I will leave a link in the description for this video so you can go check it out. And also, uh, I'll leave cards here so you can go see other, vis other videos about uh, uh, England and, and stuff like that.
well it was nice having you all here and for those of you who recently subscribed thank you thank you thank you for subscribing you know what i mean the more of us are here the more we can learn from each other that's the point you know what i'm saying and thing and uh thanks for all the comments keep them coming and also thank you for all the suggestions of videos to watch this was uh suggested to me not this particular video but just check out the norman uh conquest or invasion of england which i didn't know much about I'm gonna do some more research on it and things so I could learn, know a little bit more, you know what I mean? I'm gonna be I'm like a a, a drop fill of water in a in a <laughs> in a glass and I still have a world of information to intake just because I like knowing stuff. Anyway man, y'all take care of each other, alright? Cool runnings.